Hello and welcome to yet another exciting edition of Trains Travel. I'm your host for today, Louise Goble, and today we're coming to you from the Intercontinental Hotel at the Oratum International Airport. In our first story, colleague Nadia Adams takes us on a vintage tour of vintage cars, but do stay tuned for the rest of our lineup. Coming up next on Trends Travel this week, we look at cars. Cuba comes alive with some bright lights at night. Napoleon comes home to a revamped exhibition. And finally, bright, beautiful flowers in New York. All this and more coming up next. Vintage met sports at this lavish motoring event where the cars and the track become one. Swart Corps Raceway is the only internationally licensed kart circuit in South Africa and an international high-speed circuit for motorsport, advanced driver training and product testing. The facility is considered to be home of motorsport in the country and Swart Corps offers both spectators and participants an exciting platform where they can embrace the many different aspects of motoring from speed racing to off-road racing. I actually sat down with Chad, we got together a couple of months back and because we both know each other quite well inside the markets and we both love vehicles, we decided we are going to put together an event whereby we actually get all the enthusiasts into one place, not just the supercars which like a lot of people normally see or just the classics in one area. We decided to make an event whereby we actually brought the classics, the vintages, the collectibles and all the supercars into one space and got everybody to mingle and created what we see here today. And it actually worked really well. We had a, coll a collaboration of old and new yeah. and, and high end and and some very super expensive old classics as well. What we did here is we actually made it a bit of a dual event. So we made it for showcasing vehicles, people to mingle, get to know each other, meet each other as enthusiasts. But because we chose this specific venue, whereby we've got a racetrack, we actually made it an allowance where people can take their cars onto the track, enjoy them in a safe environment, rather than as you take them out onto the freeways. We've got other bureau of users and it becomes a little bit of a mess. This is gone off very well because the guys are able to test their cars, push them to their limits legally with no hiccups, with like medics on site, with having fire marshals and everybody available to actually just make sure that it's all a very safe, congenial kind of space to play around in with your car. A vintage car is a much older vehicle. Um, it's like pre-World War II going just after World War II, whereas your classics really sit just after that period, which is like your American muscle, the European classics, where it came out of that era where you got like high-end engines, V8s, uh, quite a lot of horsepower. It was a, the two eras just were completely, completely different. That's from about 1958 onwards. So the classics fall into like, like 58 up to 70, no, actually up to the 80s. These events also present the novice drivers with the opportunity to race on a professional raceway in a safe environment. Novice drivers are amateur drivers who gain experience on the track to an almost professional level. Uh, club events that are available, which is Michelin Car Club events as well as the Bridgestone uh, Car Club events. And it's actually just everyday drivers pitching up with their cars and coming to understand how a skid pan works, how a gymkhana works, how a track works. And obviously it's skilling yourself better as a, as a, not a novice driver and as an advanced driver. And to learn how to control your car on everyday roads. And that's what's so great about events like this is that people that are owning, um, you know, more luxury sports cars have that experience to come and experience it on track. Local artists in India's western Vadadora city collaborate with the Daimler AG's Mercedes-Benz to recreate miniatures of vintage car models revisiting the charm of the bygone era. The four-day exhibition at Sarjan Art Gallery in the city concluded with showcasing Mercedes' classic Benz collection replicas made by artists from around the city. The miniatures looked like shorter versions of the original models straight out of a suspended animation chamber. However, the one model that grabbed the attention of everyone was that of Mercedes-Benz 330, carrying an image of Nazi German dictator Adolf Hitler.
के ओल्ड मॉडल है और मर्सिडीज का उसके ऊपर काम करना है तो हमने रिसर्च करके इंटरनेट के ऊपर देखा देख के फिर पता चला कि तो हिटलर चला रहा था तो मुझे माइंड में ऐसा स्ट्राइक हुआ कि हिटलर के ऊपर ये क्यों नहीं बनाया When artist Kamal Rana was asked to replicate Mercedes-Benz 330, his research traced back the ownership of the model to Hitler. So it struck him in a eureka moment to base the theme on Hitler. माइंड मेरा भी इतना मतलब खिल गया है ना मुझे इतना पता चला है कि इतना कुछ हो सकता है जैसे हम आर्टिस्ट को भी आइडिया मिला कि हमें भी कुछ ऐसा करना चाहिए Mercedes-Benz, an extension of German company Daimler AG, is a global automobile marquee established in 1926. It primarily deals in the niche market of luxury vehicles, including cars, buses, coaches and lorries. Sarafina Mumbi is Kenya's only female minibus taxi designer. Her work involves coming up with concepts for the colorful artwork that decorate public taxis known here as Matatas. The artist, also known as Tara Arts, is working on a theme celebrating women in the country who've made notable contributions in society and championed girls' rights over the years. The artwork was inspired by a group of girls and young women living in Matare, a slum on the outskirts of Nairobi, ahead of celebrations to mark this year's International Women's Day. The 23-year-old who studied graphic design says her love for Matatu designs started in her youth. She did her first paint job in 2014 and has gone on to decorate 15 Matatas so far. I so Matatas are the main mode of transport in the country and are notorious for causing road accidents, overloading, speeding and quite frequently driving dangerously. But the business is also known for promoting a culture of artwork displayed in elaborate paintwork and graphics meant to attract customers. The sector remains male-dominated though. Tara says she often gets unsolicited advice and comments and also has to do a lot of convincing to sign up clients. She says her mother has always encouraged her to follow her passion. Challenges in the mob, Unapata, you guys want to take advantage, uh, especially when Unafanya say job after you Anapote and Ado, Mingina and Ataka, Ado's now end of Pati Balance, and Kaiz. Napia Unapata, Ukfanya job in a menu, Wana Wana could discriminate. Kuskia story, I care to the name of Boy or Kona Bebandogo, whether in a fair moral. In the capital Nairobi, Matatas represent an urban youth culture. The buses are often pimped up with decorative lights, sophisticated sound systems, smart TVs and even Wi-Fi. About 15 million commuters in the country are said to use the network daily. Yeah. 
Tara works with a team of four people who help execute her designs. Her latest project was supported by the Australian High Commission and the UN Children's Fund. There are a lot of girls studying art and craft in high school, but after that they don't really get to pursue. So for them to see this matatu and to see what Sara is doing, I think that is the message they should get. That they should actually go out there and even if it's not painting matatus, you know, graffiti, graffiti and matatu painting is a form of expression. It's more encouraging, especially seeing like Wangare Madai, Dukita Nyongo, the first lady. It's very inspiring knowing that these women have made the turn inside that vehicle. I feel like one of them, even me, I can be there one day. Tara says she wants to mentor and inspire more young women to take an interest in matatu designing and also encourage others to venture into more male-dominated areas of work in the future. That was Kenya's only female minibus taxi designer showcasing her work which was inspired by young women and girls from the city of Nairobi. One of the many ways women from around the world are celebrating International Women's Day. Right now we take you to ad break and we'll see you right after that. Thirty-two nations, forty-four matches live on SABC One and nineteen SABC radio stations. SABC is the official broadcaster of the 2018 FIFA World Cup Russia. Nations, 44 matches live on SABC One and 19 SABC radio stations. SABC is the official broadcaster of the 2018 FIFA World Cup Russia. Cuba is not really known for its bright city lights and bustling city life, but one artist is hoping to change all that as he restores Havana's neon lights, hoping to bring tourists back into the Caribbean city. After dusk in Havana, an ice blue neon sign illuminates the faded facade of the Sydney El Magano, one of the many abandoned movie houses in the Cuban capital, lighting up a once vibrant corner at the heart of the Caribbean city that had gone pitch black in recent decades. The glowing neon italic letters fill the building's colonial facade with an art deco accent between the doors below and the wraparound balcony above. It is the work of Cuban artist Kadir Lopez Neves, who is restoring the vintage signs of the cinemas, hotels and cabarets that lit up Havana's nightlife in its 1950s heyday. His project, dubbed Havana Light, Neon and Signs, has so far restored around 50 signs, reflecting a broad revival in Havana. Natura, un buon uomo, un corrente del muro, 
Era un proyecto que en principio no aspiraba a crecer tanto, pero la dinámica de la misma obra fue llevando a un crecimiento casi insospechado. En los últimos dos años creció muchísimo. Ya llevamos alrededor de 58 neones colocados en la, en la ciudad y todo empezó con una idea bastante sencilla que fue iluminar los teatros que estaban de alguna forma desapareciendo como imagen pública de la ciudad. Eh, era una acción sencilla, una acción de contraste, donde empezamos a hacer el cambio a partir de, de la luz, que es un concepto muy básico, pero muy poderoso. The city, one of the architectural jewels of Latin America, has been enjoying a tourism boom. After Fidel Castro's 1959 leftist revolution, many of Havana's ritzy entertainment venues, often run by American mobsters and frequented by the rich and famous, were shuttered or slowly became run down. Very nice. We saw it very nice and it gave color to the square. Le dio colorido a la cuadra, como no. Y recordando, lo ve? Y recordando cómo era esto. Igual como, como lo es el, el, el restaurante Floredita, lo, como lo es el cabaret Capri, ¿sabes? Todo, muy, 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 muy bonito. Muy bonito que se ve. Over the decades, tropical weather wrought havoc on the neon signs. The communist-run island, laboring under a U.S. embargo, often lacked the funds and know-how to fix them. As elsewhere, other forms of lighting, such as LEDs, proved cheaper and ornate neon signs were abandoned. Y llevo ya 23 años de carrera continuada. Y esto ha venido a ser, digamos que un, un atractivo más, pero un atractivo desde la preservación, desde la mmm, dinámica de, de la restauración de algo que de alguna forma tenía tendencia a desaparecer, algo que aparente es muy frágil, pero que tiene un impacto muy poderoso, que es cambiar la escena urbana con el cambio más mínimo, que es aportando luz. El turismo, por supuesto, que que es sensible a todos estos cambios, inmediatamente las zonas oscuras se convertían de marginales a, a, a fotografiadas. ¿no? Y esto de alguna forma es, eh, era lo más importante, digamos, cómo establecer una, un ciclo donde se enriquece eh, no solamente el neón, sino el trabajo y el impacto social que el neón va teniendo en diferentes esferas. Lopez, whose works play with memory and nostalgia, set about restoring the neon lights of a dozen cinemas as a project of the Havana Benil Arts Festival in 2015. His works delighted locals. Shining incandescent from afar, the sign also helped to make the rundown area more salubrious by chasing away shady characters. The initiative has become self-financing thanks to the sale of a new commercial sign to Cuba's fledging private sector, costing between 200 and 3,000 US dollars. Close to Havana seafront, the Bar Cabana sign flashes red, while around the corner, La Farmacia restaurant sign burns white. For myself and Kadir to connect, and build this bridge where we want to continue the growth of neon and the appreciation of neon throughout the world, Havana was the perfect partner for us because you had this old history and you had this new art that were blending together and it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to bring back the neon lights to a beautiful city. Lopez says he has a large contract to restore the lights of Havana's famed Tropicana nightclub which in its prime boasted famous patrons such as Hollywood stars Frank Sinatra and Humphrey Bogart. Amid a global neon revival, the initiative started attracting enthusiasts from all over the world who offered their expertise. Finalmente estamos logrando hacer una sede del neón en la ciudad de La Habana que va a tener un taller, que va a tener sala de, de proyección, etc. y que va de alguna forma a incidir muy, muy de manera eh, impactante Foreign expertise has come in handy, Lopez says. There are only a few craftsmen left in Cuba who know how to bend the neon tubes into letters and fold them with gas to create different colors. Tens of thousands of people line the streets of Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo, to watch an annual Buddhist pageant called Nawam Maha Perahera. Drummers, traditional dancers, and torchbearers escorted dozens of beautifully decorated elephants in the colorful parade spanning over three kilometers. 
The pageant which starts at the Gangaramaya Buddhist Temple, one of the prominent religious places in the capital of this Indian Ocean Island, has been held annually for decades. Elephants in the parade sway to the beats of the drums as Buddhist priests observe a state transfit for the next nearly three-hour event. Thousands of tourists also flock to the city to watch the parade, with hotels reporting they were jam-packed with visitors. It's the fourth time I'm in Sri Lanka and the third time I'm at the Parahera. I like the Parahera very much. I've been here since yesterday to look for the elephants, to look the people prepare themselves. We all feel very excited because we heard a lot about uh, Sri Lankan Parahera, which is famous most throughout the world. The highlight of the event was a casket carried by an elephant which Buddhists believe contained a relic of Buddha. However, the first day of the two-day pageant had to be cancelled when a thunderstorm hit the city. The International Yoga Festival kicked off at a local Hindu monastery in North Indian holy town of Rashikesh on Saturday. Indian Vice President Venkala Naidu, along with several other leaders, marked the beginning of the five-day-long festival by lighting lamps. Children, yoga practitioners, performed intricate yoga sanas at the inauguration event in the presence of Naidu. Indian Tourism Minister K.J. Alphonse, Chief of India's Northern Uttarakhand State, Trivendra Singh Rawat, and its Governor, Dr. K.K. Paul. The event brought together a strong crowd of 2,000 yoga enthusiasts from 100 countries, more than 80 revered experts and yoga instructors from 20 countries participated in the festival. And they will hold daily yoga sessions and will be teaching more than different 200 styles of the ancient art. Yoga is one of India's most successful cultural exports. It is a discipline that dates back thousands of years, has gained immense international prominence over the last several decades as a holistic regime for the mind and body. I will be back with more of Trends Travel right after this break, so don't go anywhere. Two nations, 44 matches live on SABC One and 19 SABC radio stations. SABC is the official broadcaster of the 2018 FIFA World Cup Russia. Yeah. Yes. Yes.
Sports Live every Saturday and Sunday at 7:30 p.m. The Western Cape needs national government to fulfill its mandate on ensuring the bulk water supply. We must ensure that the city of Cape Town never confronts this particular situation again. The ESCOM is serious about stamping out corruption, which is why uh, the market is now beginning to, to accommodate us. Looking at the neighboring countries, expecting Botswana just to see partly cloudy skies with a half 34 in Khaboron. News today at 3 p.m. from Monday to Friday on SABC News. 32 nations, 44 matches live on SABC One and 19 SABC radio stations. SABC is the official broadcaster of the 2018 FIFA World Cup Russia. Welcome back to the show that takes you around the world from the comfort of your couch. Right now we stop in France at the home of Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte has come home with the reopening of a renovated museum dedicated to him at his residence at the Palace of Fontainebleau. After nine months of works on the lighting and security, the Spruce Up Museum opened its doors on an exhibition tracing the life of the French Emperor who conquered large swaths of Europe in the early 19th century, leaving a lasting legacy. The collection features recently acquired treasures such as Sevres porcelain tableware, including a tea set emblazoned with the portraits of the imperial family dating from 1812, which prompted the museum to tighten security. Le seul ensemble euh, en porcelaine de Sèvres réalisé par la manufacture impériale et qui concentre comme cela les portraits de toute cette famille à l'élévation récente. Napoléon a une image, c'est presque paradoxal, mais extrêmement forte et extrêmement bonne dans une certaine mesure, plus qu'en France. Et on s'est aperçu quand on, quand on regarde quelles sont les personnalités politiques les, les plus connues, en tout cas pour la, le registre français, c'est Napoléon qui sort toujours en, en premier. Donc pour l'étranger, Napoléon est l'homme politique qui caractérise la France. Other star pieces include the coronation sword and one of them the golden laurel leaf used to crown him in 1804, as well as a portrait of him wearing them on the day of the ceremony. Mais on va lancer une souscription très importante pour euh, euh, mobiliser les Français et les étrangers justement autour de cet escalier parce qu'il est, euh, est malade, il est atteint d'une maladie de la pierre, il faut le, le déconstruire pour le reconstruire. Et donc euh, au printemps prochain, on va lancer un, un, une souscription publique pour que chacun puisse contribuer à la restauration de cet escalier. Donc l'escalier est vraiment un emblème du château. Il est, il, on peut le relier à, à l'ensemble des rois de France, on peut le relier tout aussi bien à Napoléon de façon très, très identitaire et très, et très forte. Renovation at the museum is not over, with the director stating that they are preparing to launch a fundraising drive to collect money to renovate the palace's iconic staircase whose stoneware is crumbling. Akua Ebenoa Donko makes chocolates from organic locally sourced cocoa in Ghana's capital, Accra. She is one of few trained chocolatiers in the country who are carving out a niche for themselves with an aim to promote chocolate made at home in a market that's dominated by foreign brands. We just pour them out on the machine, which is a country machine. So they are coming to temper it. Tempering is a very important
Akua started her company DecoCraft in 2013 with an initial capital of $1,000. Her handmade chocolates come in different shapes and sizes and also come in custom-made designs. We make chocolate from the cocoa liquor. We don't have enough machinery to start processing chocolate from the cocoa beans. So we buy already grinded cocoa beans, which is called cocoa mass, from another company in Tema. So when we come here, we process it, and then we make chocolate bars and filled chocolates. When I talk about filled chocolates, they are the tiny ones that has sometimes caramel, peanut, cornflakes in them. So we make both the bars and the filled chocolates. Akua says Ghana is capable of adding value to its cocoa and in turn reap more benefits instead. After processing the chocolate liqueur, she adds flavors and ingredients like nuts and other ingredients to produce a variety of bars. We use the actual cocoa, actual cocoa butter. We don't substitute it for vegetable fats. We use the pure cocoa butter. So you get the creamy chocolate which is also healthy because we are using the natural things or the actual cocoa products and not substitutes. The entrepreneur who is also a communication design graduate says her products don't have artificial additives and preservatives usually found in chocolates on the market. DecoCraft also specializes in cakes and pastries. The company supplies chocolate flavors for guests at weddings, parties and corporate events. The company sells about 300 kilograms of chocolates every month. Chocolate pieces sell from between one to three dollars each. It smells very creamy, it tastes sweet and it tastes natural. I, I as a customer eat as well but then do it for all my clients and I'm talking about in excess of 200, 300 pieces for any of the awards that we do. Exodus actually is into um, and, and, and recognitions, which is awards. So anytime we're doing an award, like an auto award, oil and gas award, manufacturing awards, we actually give it to them. And I think it also paved the way for her to, to get access to a lot of clients. Akua markets her chocolates on social media and online shops as well as selected stores. She plans to expand her business to reach customers in other African countries in the future. Chinese artist and dissident Ai Weiwei unveiled a 60-meter inflatable rubber raft artwork carrying more than 300 anonymous oversized figures in Sydney, highlighting the plight of refugees across the world. Initially designed for the National Gallery of Prague, the artwork titled Law of the Journey is the centerpiece of the 2018 Sydney Biennale and is made from the same manufactured rubber as that of vessels that carried refugees across the Mediterranean Sea. The artwork is installed on Kakatoo Island, a former shipbuilding site. Even we are living in a very peaceful uh, world, almost like a fairy tale in Australia, but still we cannot disassociate our connections to other human beings, the suffering, and uh, the, the tragic life of our uh, global human community. Uh, so when I first time went to Lesbos, Greece Island, when I see boats 
uh, after boats of refugees approach Europe. And uh, the people are, doesn't belong to Europe. They don't speak the same language. They don't have the same religion. They don't dress the same. They, they, they have children, women, you know, elderly people climb out of this kind of dinghy boat, which is very, very poor, poor uh, transportation. The exile artist is also in Australia, promoting his documentary Human Flow and will speak at its Australian launch at the Sydney Opera House. So people are disappearing, and thousands of them, children and uh, people, you can say they, they lost their lives in, in the journey searching for, for freedom, for safety, for, for some kind of shelter and compassion. But once they arrived in Europe, basically they're being refused by all kind of excuse, politicians, policies, and uh, basically they, they are being neglected. I saw this piece, I feel this piece is really made for here. The industrial uh, condition with the history of early uh, migrants and, uh, and also still current struggles with uh, Australia's record in towards of refugees. The Giza Pyramids hosted the epic opera Aida, a tale of love and betrayal in ancient Egypt on Friday. Nearly 2,800 people attended the historic performance held for the first time since 2009 against the backdrop of the pyramids and the Sphinx. The four-act opera tells the story of Aida, a princess held as a slave in ancient Egypt. حلو قوي يعني من ناحية اللبس الإضاءة الشو نفسه الطريقة اللي معمول بيها لا الميوزك الصوت كله يعني حاجة فظيعة حلو قوي. Aida chooses to die with her Egyptian lover after he's sentenced to death for betrayal. Italian tenor Dario De Vietri performed as Radames, the Egyptian warrior love-struck by Ethiopian princess Aida, who was played by Serbian soprano Dragana Radogovic. The opera was originally commissioned to Giuseppe Verdi in 1869 by Egypt's ruler at the time, Ismail Pasha. Aida being, um, it was commissioned by, uh, I learned that it was commissioned by uh, Pasha Ishmael in uh, 1871, I think it was the first performance. And uh, so it's, it's fascinating to read about it and uh, some of the history, yeah. So, and, and with the backdrop of the pyramids, uh, I'm really excited to be here. This year, the performance was organized in coordination with government bodies to revive the country's struggling tourism industry. هم هايلين أداءهم هايل الموسيقى جميلة المكان رائع محتاج أعتقد شوية حاجات بسيطة ويبقى الأمور كلها جميلة يعني فكرة إن إحنا يبقى ليفلز أكتر من كده ده ممكن يكون مناسب أكتر دي وجهة نظر طبعا ما كانتش حاجة سهلة أوبرا عايدة في نعمة عملتش في مصر من 2009 تقريبا 
فان احنا نرجع الموضوع تاني وان احنا نتفق مع الفنانين الاجانب ان هم يرجعوا عشان يغنوا هنا في مصر نرجع حدث كبير زي ده عشان يجي ونتفق مع كل الوزارات والاثار والدار الاوبرا المصريه والسياحه فالكوردينيشن بتاع كل الجهات دي كان كان صعب بس هي دي حاجه كلنا عايزين نعملها ان كل الاحداث الثقافيه وكل الاحداث الفنيه المهمه اللي كانت طول عمرها بتتعمل في مصر زمان ان هي لازم ترجع تاني لان دي احد الحاجات المهمه اللي هترجع تاني السياحه في مصر Egypt's tourism sector has suffered many setbacks since the uprising that toppled autocrat Hosni Mubarak in 2011, but still remains a vital source of foreign currency. I see a very big impact on you, and I'm telling you that there are people who came to the opera to come back again. This is a very good thing, a very good thing, a very good thing. لما الحدث ده يتثبت ويتكرر كل سنه المضمون بتاعه هيبقى قوي جدا على البلد. Time sure does fly when you're having fun, but don't despair, we're not done yet. Coming up after the break, we take you to a beautiful garden and we see a few winged creatures. Special assignment. Crime keeps the society in terror and pain. Why so? If, if someone phones me, this phones me, tells me, okay, okay, I need a silver. And I get your driving, I'll take it. What pushes normal people to be so hard, heartless, and brutally kill one another? The other side of it could be more for their own psychological need. Uh, it might be part of a sexual fantasy that they have. Uh, it could be about power and control. After proper investigation is followed, the perpetrator gets arrested. There is quite a massive process. And I think we have to have it, so I think just as I said. Emotional scars remain. We would pay any price to get him back. And the sad reality is that it's, it's gone. Special assignment. We unravel the truth every Sunday at 21.30. Technology is used for both positive and negative. Some governments have blocked the internet in times of protest. With this internet blackout, it's impossible for me to do it, so I have to travel to Douala. This act is a true violation of the rights of citizens. In Africa, people are always coming up with innovative ways to use technology to solve some of their problems. The more interesting piece of technology is actually the artificial intelligence. AI, it's utilizing data to make your life easier. Our network will give you Africa's technology and social media news. For all your technology news, join Sipumela Lazondi every Saturday at 17.30. 32 nations, 44 matches live on SABC1 and 19 SABC radio stations. SABC is the official broadcaster of the 2018 FIFA World Cup Russia. Welcome back, trendy travelers. It's almost time to say goodbye. But before we do, we leave in the capable hands of Mother Nature with a perfect combination of brilliant butterflies and beautiful flowers. What's that smell? is the first thing you wonder as you walk down a long subway tiled hallway in the basement of an office building in Manhattan and into a warm, earthy, sweet and herbal fragrance that fills 1,200 square foot space that is the vertical farm, Farm One. Then, the overwhelming colors from bespoke flowers, stems and roots from herbs and microgreens greet your eyes. So Farm One is a vertical farm and we're in the middle of Manhattan and we grow all kinds of rare herbs, edible flowers and microgreens selling to the best chefs in New York City. These flowers have never touched the earth nor felt the warmth of the sun. Instead, Farm One created a completely controlled environment where they use only the seed, water and nutrients to grow their produce in vertically stacked hydroponic trays under light emitting diodes on rolling racks. And we can use LED lights to give the plants a perfect day of sunlight year round. It's also kind of cool because we can stack these growing areas so that we can have a much more efficient use of space. 
And so in this small room, which is just you know, 1,200 square feet in this farm, uh, we can grow crops that might take a whole big field uh, to grow. There are no pesticides or chemicals or soil used in the process as in traditional farming. You know, we can harvest and deliver same day. And so the product isn't sitting on a truck, it's not in cold storage, it's super fresh. And so these chefs can really taste the difference. Um, and it's, it's exciting for them to taste something that's almost like in their back garden of their restaurant. The company uses materials like coconut husks to prop the plants up and give them structure. We're growing edible flowers and micros uh, really for two reasons. Firstly, chefs in New York City can't get hold of these products. They tend to ship them in from California, even Israel sometimes. Uh, but also, we can get a pretty good price for those things because they're such a specialty product. We really want to use this kind of farm as a model to build additional farms in new cities. And so there's many cities in the U.S. that have great restaurant scenes and also don't have a lot of local uh, fresh produce. So we think there's lots of opportunity for us to, to grow into those areas and then later on maybe around the world. Farm One was started in 2016 in a 300 square foot space in the Institute of Culinary Education by Lane, who was a software developer before he tasted a papalo leaf at a Santa Monica's farmer's market and embarked on a new career of bringing fresh herbs and edible flowers to New York City's finest restaurants. The results have been very well received. Farm One's produce was all sold out in its first space in a matter of months, which put them in their second location at 77 Worth Street, below the office building in New York's Tribeca neighborhood. You're just kind of looking for like little microscopic imperfections, you know, because I'm ultimately the one who has to be in front of these chefs. I, and they're very discerning and very demanding. We need to make sure that what they ask for is what they're getting. Um, if anyone's not afraid to tell you they're unhappy with something, it's a chef. At two Michelin starred restaurant, Young Sik pastry chef Yunji Lee uses marigold flowers to adorn and accentuate the flavor of her petit fours. The flower petals can be no larger than the size of the home button on an iPhone. Because if it's too big, the marigold flower flavor is, can be stronger, too much strong. So that's why it should be this size. If you cut, we have a layer of the passion fruit caramel, ginger cream, and chocolate sable, a little bit of marigold flour to give some acidity and sweetness, a little bit of bitter flavor. For every single plate, we need uh, precision and perfection, so we are always working for that. And we always asking to them, like, uh, we, we need this size, this color, this length, and every time uh, they bring to us the perfect, if the perfect one that we want. So the quality, I can trust for the quality, consistency, and perfection, that's why we are working with them. We use the lemon basil herb from Farm One. We infuse, we infuse uh, in the milk and sorbet basis. So far, Farm One has focused on growing microgreens, herbs and flowers in Manhattan for chefs in New York City. For patrons who want to explore the farm, Farm One gives tours and a glass of Prosecco for $50. The next step will be to build additional farms in new cities, first in the US, then around the world.
Thousands of butterflies floated and flirted around an aviary of the Santiago Zoo for the opening of the zoo's annual butterfly jungle. Can you find some over there? What's over there? At Butterfly Jungle, the walk-through aviary has been transformed into a temporary home for over 30 species of butterflies. As visitors make their way through the rainforest habitat, thousands of colorful, eye-catching butterflies surround them, fluttering lightly through the warm air to find flowers to feed upon. <laughs> <laughs> this is also home to numerous green plants and 18 species of exotic birds. You're back, bro. While fun for both adults and children, the five-week-long event also brings awareness to the plight of declining butterfly populations all over the world, as well as the local butterfly populations in San Diego. A living exhibition of flowers takes center stage in New York City's concrete jungle. Bright violet, soft pink, white, yellow, a spectrum of color is on display at the Orchid Show at the New York Botanical Garden. More than 7,000 individual plants are in bloom, the most ever for the exhibition now in its 16th year. This year's show also boasts the most diverse array of orchids. The exhibition was designed and crafted by acclaimed Belgian floral artist Daniel Ost. Ost, 63, said he wants to display the flowers wildly and naturally. Orchids don't grow alone. They grow on other plants. They grow in. Uh, they grow. Uh, they don't. Are they are not used to be arranged by the a florist taught. While Ost fancies the orchid, he does not have a favorite flower. I don't discriminate flowers. Even if I have to make something exceptional out of a dandelion, I will do it. Uh, but I adore it. To me, uh, orchids are the queens of the, of the botanical world. Ast is known around the world for his large-scale flower installations and said when he works, the flowers consume his every thought. And I, for, I forget about people, and I forget about myself, and I only think flowers. The Orchid Show runs until April 22nd, 2018 at the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx. And that's all we have here on today's edition of Trends Travel. We do hope that you're enjoying the lineup and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Same time, same place. I was your host, Eloise Scoville.
we were shooting um, a campaign. We're telling genuine stories from real people that have been affected by the SAPC. It's also interesting to get the backstory in terms of their dreams to be on screen and eventually getting the pleasure to do that. And understanding that they're communicating on a platform that speaks to millions of people. And speaks to how the SABC can fulfill its mandate. The SABC represents the opportunity for so many young South Africans, for old South Africans, to be able to look at the world that they may not experience any other way. People should continue to pay their TV license because it allows the SABC to bring quality programming. The TV license is really part of the lifeblood of the channel and the corporation. When you're listening to your favorite jams, you're listening to your favorite radio DJ, you, you must know that you made it possible by paying your TV license. It's such a holistic process that goes into TV licenses. It's not only one part where we say South Africans have to pay for TV licenses. You pay a TV license because you get so much value out of it and that's the content that you get every single day on the SABC platforms. I have been in the film industry now for 51 years. I am quite satisfied with the evolution of television now that you have got a lot of actors and you have got a lot of crew members which will also play part of uh, you know, paying our licenses because I think it's proper. 32 nations, 44 matches live on SABC1 and 19 SABC radio stations. SABC is the official broadcaster of the 2018 FIFA World Cup Russia.